Hello, everybody. Welcome to the third study session on the Communist Manifesto. We'll try to cover the rest of the book this time. So uh, chapters three and four, which are noticeably shorter than the previous chapters. I would say that these two chapters, uh, they're probably not as uh, difficult. They don't have anything too complicated in them. They also tend to like repeat ideas that were in the previous ones. That said, uh, if you haven't read the text, then these chapters are going to be the strangest because they talk about competing socialist tendencies and competing political tendencies in 1847 or 1848. So if, if you haven't read the text, then you might be like, what even are these? Well, I guess we just get right into it. So um, the first question... I was going to ask you guys is what are feudal and clerical socialism that the manifesto describes? So Marx describes as uh, feudal socialism is reactionary anti-capitalism, that anti-capitalist movement of nobles, of people who lost their property in a, through the transition to capitalism. So it's a feudal reaction against capitalism. Yeah, that's a pretty good answer. Um, feudal classes who didn't like capitalism. Uh, do you guys know what uh, narratism was or what the Narodniks were? If you've read like some really early Lenin, then he talks about these uh, people called the Narodniks, who uh, Narod is, uh, I'm probably butchering that, but it's Russian for people. And there used to be this party called the Narodnaya Volia Party, which was the People's Will Party. And there were these um, revolutionary intellectuals who went uh, to the peasants and they um, they basically romanticized the feudal um, village community of the Middle Ages. And they thought that that was like the ideal uh, type of society because the in pre-capitalist societies, like feudal societies, whatever, the villages would often own the land collectively every year or every two years or something they would like a lot the land like okay this family gets this land this family gets this land they would like collectively manage the land in capitalism it was all privatized or um, when capitalism was arising so the narodniks thought that this was like an ideal that was their idea of socialism so their whole problem with capitalism was that capitalism is destroying the medieval village community and lenin was like um arguing against these people they were like russian utopian socialists they're a good example of like this reactionary socialism. So this kind of socialism that fights against progress, whose main problem with capitalism is that capitalism is uh, breaking down the old order of things and creating something new. Whereas um, Marx, of course, thought that that was the only good thing about capitalism, uh, destroying feudal um, relations and the feudal system of the Middle Ages. That was the only good thing about capitalism. But for these reactionary socialists, that was terrible. They they really wanted to keep things in the time before capitalism. And pretty much all of these different uh, tendencies of reactionary socialism that Marx and Engels describe in the Communist Manifesto, like if you know what the Narodniks are, then if you look through these, you see like none of them are exactly the same as the Russian Narodniks, but they all have like overlap with them. And probably similar reactionary socialist uh, movements probably existed in most countries. So feudal socialism, as was stated, it was like kind of quasi uh, fake socialism, mainly advocated by feudal aristocrats and feudal classes that didn't want capitalism to come in and change things. Clerical socialism was... Uh, another sort of a variation of this but it was just using uh christianity you kind of still see like certain aspects of this today because like the manifesto mentions that nothing is easier than to give christian asceticism a socialist tinge has not christianity declaimed against private property against marriage against the state has it not preached in the place of these charity and poverty celibacy and mortification of the flesh monastic life and mother church christian socialism is but the holy water with which the priest consecrates the heart burnings of the aristocrat we still see uh various uh types of socialism that's motivated by 
religion and even motivated by Christianity even today. Liberation theology, like the Sandinistas in uh, Latin America, even uh, Hugo Chavez was like a Christian socialist. Not that there's anything really wrong with that. You can be a Christian and a socialist and it's all fine and good, but it's just a good point that, yeah, it's actually really easy to take Christianity and like give it a little sprinkle of socialism because Jesus is kind of a, you know, he would attack attack the rich and hang out with the poor people and stuff. What about petty bourgeois socialism? Isn't that um like the bourgeois who rather than um who like they they don't want to like abolish uh the class divisions they just want to like make everyone bourgeois or something uh well we actually get to that later because there is something that they call bourgeois or conservative socialism but i mean you know the petty bourgeois like the small property owners Oh, well, petty bourgeois socialism. Well, what kind of socialism? Uh, what kind of socialism do you think a petty bourgeois person would like? A type of socialism that doesn't really remove class distinctions, but lowers them, so there's less like differences between classes. Uh, to me, it almost uh, seems like you know um, they just want the means of production. Mm -hmm passed down to make the uh so that they become the owners and the bosses but the 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 class system remains unchanged that would be my guess right so um if we think about why the proletariat is um the revolutionary class or the most revolutionary class is because the proletariat doesn't own any of the means of production so it's in the interest of the proletariat that it becomes uh public property or a societal or common property. But for all these people who, you know, are property owners, uh, capitalists, uh, small business owners, landlords, what have you, whenever they try to think of an ideal society, they always want an ideal society where they get to keep what they have, right? What Marx and Engels call petty bourgeois socialism here is basically making sure that the feudal small owner classes and the feudal petty bourgeois classes don't go bankrupt. Uh, we talked about this last time, like why the uh, petty bourgeoisie can be somewhat revolutionary and somewhat reactionary. They can be revolutionary because capitalism is driving them bankrupt, so they might uh, ally with the proletariat against the capitalists. But they also can be reactionary because they want to be owners themselves and um, they might turn against progress and they might think well capitalism is uh, emerging capitalism is creating a new order of things and that's ruining the petty bourgeoisie so let's resist against this progress and let's go back to to the middle ages so they can be a reactionary in that sense so this type of reactionary petty bourgeois socialism is um, basically feudal uh, manufacturers handicraftsmen uh, guild masters. In the Middle Ages, the city tradespeople and city uh, manufacturers used to be organized into guilds. And these guilds had like a tight monopoly on uh, production. Uh, these types of reactionary petty bourgeois socialists, their ideal vision was that the guild system stays in place, the uh, feudal system of manufacturing stays in place, the feudal uh, village or whatever stays in place, so that's the similarity to the Narodniks. And they oppose capitalism because capitalism is a challenge to this. Capitalism drives these feudal uh, small producers bankrupt, so that was their problem with capitalism. But it's entirely reactionary. It's also not based in the proletariat. Would you consider, like, Proudhonism to be this sort of a petty bourgeois socialism? So Proudhon was the first anarchist i guess we can say that um didn't he coin the term anarchism i don't know like was there somebody even before who can be considered an anarchist yes yes there could be it's william godwin and there was also win stanley in the 18th century but they weren't uh, anarchists in the sense of uh, they didn't use the term anarchism but they had anarchistic ideals yeah. and before that there were the uh sandemanians but i think the sandemanians were of um, the levelers. Levelers was a class of uh, ditch diggers in England, right? 
the levelers, they were kind of proto-anarchists. And then after, after them, there was William Godwin. William Godwin had a more Christian notion, like, yeah, there wasn't like hum- human power ruling society, but there was a, uh, like a Christian co- co- concept of what they would call a spirit that would rule society, like, abstractly. Well, I guess this is kind of going off topic, but um, not too much. So Proudhon, um, I think he coined the term anarchism. At least he is widely considered to be like the first anarchist, even if that's not literally the case. But um, the reason uh, I would say that he did advocate a uh, sort of uh, petty bourgeois socialism is that he came up with a thing that's now called mutualism, which means that there's these individual uh, small producers who um, they all own their own means of production. A bunch of small owners, nobody's allowed to exploit anybody else. And then they just produce their own things and then they trade them with each other. And there's no state. So that's uh, Proudhon style mutualist anarchism, stateless market socialism. I would consider it a type of petty bourgeois socialism because it just wants to make everybody a small owner. Um, could the same be applied to, like, Kropotkin's weird, uh, like, guild thing that he had? I don't know how to really describe it. Um, those who are more versed in that can. I mean, this is kind of going off topic, but basically, like, anarchism seems to have this evolution where you start with Proudhon, where everybody's a small owner, then you move to, like, Bakunin, where you have these communes or communities or whatever, but they still have, like, communal markets, and it's still, like type of market socialism, but it's more collective. And then you get Kropotkin, who was an anarcho-communist, who um, once again is more close to, like, closer to what we would think of as socialism. Those are still not quite reactionary because they don't want to go back in time. Like, they don't resist development of capitalism. They don't want to go back to feudalism. Now, there's a thing called uh, German or "Quote unquote true socialism." Does anybody um, want to explain what that is? German socialism was like trying to apply the French uh, socialist theories to Germany, even though Germany wasn't as developed as France. It was more uh, semi-feudal. To an extent, we'll get to the utopian socialists in a bit. Those were like the French people mainly utopian socialist that's also where the term communist comes from i think socialism is a german word communism is a french word but german or true socialism as they called it imagine you take french utopian socialism and then you like smash hegel into it or you smash like german idealism into it that was kind of the image that i got this is what the manifesto says it is actually pretty funny it is well known that the monks you know, in the Middle Ages, that they wrote silly lives of Catholic saints over the manuscripts on which classical works of ancient heathendom had been written. I'm assuming that means that they took, like, ancient uh, Greek manuscripts and then they wrote their own, like, uh, medieval, like, Catholic stuff on top of it. So then uh, Marx and Engels say, the German literati reversed this process with profane French literature, they wrote their philosophical nonsense beneath the French original, so I guess that's a joke. I don't think you can take a text and then write under the text that's there. That would be pretty impossible. For instance, beneath the French criticism of the economic functions of money, they wrote alienation of humanity, and beneath the French criticism of the bourgeois state, they wrote dethronement of the category of the general, and so forth. It's basically just a a joke or a jab at the fact that they're taking a thing that's not great, but kind of good, and they're just making it much worse. They're taking this uh, naive type of socialism, and they're completely ruining it. This type of stuff reminds me of some people that still go around these days, like saying really uh, weird-sounding things. They took uh, French utopian socialism or French utopian communism, and they kind of stripped it of all its economic uh, analysis and all concreteness and all that was um, somehow like clearly political and class-based. And they tried to make it completely philosophical instead of political and classless instead of class-based. For example, so if the French criticize 
money or if they criticize capitalism, then the German true socialists would say that this me this is alienation of humanity. So they're just making it really vague and really general. I think Marx and Engels, they didn't quite come out of that crowd of people, but they sort of did because Marx and Engels were uh, left-wing Hegelians. Hegelian philosophy eventually kind of turned into weird stuff like this, um, estrangement of the human essence and alienation. And, you know, Marx himself has his own theory of alienation, but it actually is tied to really existing material conditions and not just something uh, general. Yeah, I guess in conclusion, I would just say that it's a hipster ideology. It's entirely speculative, not related to real world uh, events or material conditions or reality in any way, because those kinds of people thought that analyzing material conditions is somehow not philosophical. To be really philosophical, you have to like retreat into the abstract categories. And then there's bourgeois or conservative socialism. Does anybody want to say something about this? Where are you going to say something, PRP? Essentially, bourgeois socialism or conservative socialism. So you have like the uh, not the entirety of the bourgeois, but like a, a small like faction of the bourgeois, or like a faction of the bourgeois that um, they don't really care about um, erasing the class divides so much as they care about um, bringing everybody to a bourgeois level. So in some ways, they're more capitalistic than most capitalists. Like, oh, you know, we don't, uh, we can bring everybody to a bourgeois level uh, of class instead of a racing class. Let's just make everyone bourgeois. Yeah. And even these days, you see a lot of people who think that poverty is decreasing in the world automatically. And yeah, if we just let capitalism do its thing for long enough, and nobody will be poor anymore. Everybody's going to be rich. But it just doesn't work like that. But yeah, it, the thing that all of these uh, different types of socialism have in common, all these reactionary types of socialism, is that if the feudal socialism is socialism where the feudal uh, landlords and aristocracy get to keep things the way they want and they want they, they get their ideal society and the petty bourgeois socialism is uh, socialism where they get to have their ideal society where the small manufacturers and guilds and whatever control everything for the uh, conservative or bourgeois socialists it's um, the bourgeois who control everything and uh, it's an idealized, romanticized bourgeois society. It's a bourgeois society without any of the problems. I would add that what should be noticed about all of these is that it's socialism for the specific interests of a class or group, not socialism for the interests of the general working, the largest group, rather, the working class. It's in, essentially it's um, socialism for the interests of everybody other than the workers and it's it could be equated to the uh to kind of like the death throes of each of these um it, it's funny how they all rely on some very warped form of socialism uh as a final resistance against the change in um social relations yeah definitely in some ways is that kind of what um like what we call trickle down economics nowadays is that kind of like what uh bourgeois socialists like were basically advocating i mean that's what capitalists advocates and bourgeois i think bourgeois socialists are a lot like capitalists in that aspect but well uh bourgeois socialism definitely has the thing in common with modern uh capitalist ideology that modern capitalist ideology claims anybody can become rich and that it's all somehow fair um but yeah, just to clarify, none of these, uh, none of these uh, reactionary socialist ideologies. We wouldn't even consider these socialists these days. They're, these are completely strange compared to any modern or actual form of socialism. None of these advocate that uh, workers collectively own the means of production, uh, except the utopians. Some of the utopians, at least. Yeah, would you say that uh, bourgeois socialism is like a? Proto social democracy in that it's a more humanitarian, idealist outlook of capitalism. Yeah, this is um, pretty funny. So the manifesto says the bourgeoisie naturally conceives the world in which it is supreme to be the best. 
and bourgeois socialism develops this comfortable conception into various more or less complete systems in requiring the proletariat to carry out such a system and thereby to march straightway into the social new Jeru- Jerusalem, you know, sort of a supposed heaven on earth. You know, if this, if only they had this kind of system, it would be like heaven on earth. It but requires in reality that the proletariat should remain within the bounds of existing society, but should cast away all its hateful ideas concerning the bourgeoisie. So um, they think if the proletariat was, would only stop having these um, ideas of class struggle, then everything would be good. And it says... Bourgeois socialism attains adequate expression when and only when it becomes a mere figure of speech, free trade for the benefit of the working class, protective duties for the benefit of the working class, prison reform for the benefit of the working class. This is the last word and the only seriously meant word of bourgeois socialism. It is summed up in the phrase, the bourgeois is a bourgeois for the benefit of the working class. I mean, I would almost want to add like, the bourgeoisie exploits the workers, but only for the benefit of the working class. And that's definitely something we still see. Like, the bourgeoisie is a weird class. Like, the capitalist class is a weird class because it claims to defend everybody's interest. The feudal classes, to some extent, they were pretty blatant. They were like, yeah, we're just better than everybody, and you just keep in line, and the king is a god on earth or whatever. Uh, and you're just a serf, so you just keep doing your serf stuff. But the capitalists, they pretend like, no, we're all on the same team, and the capitalist is just, uh, he's not a class enemy of the worker. The capitalist parties, they wouldn't stay in power for very long if they got only capitalists to vote for them, you know? They really rely on the workers to be foolish enough to support them, or to at least not actively oppose them. And yeah, it mentions examples of uh, bourgeois socialism as all kinds of reformers, philanthropists, which are like um, people who donate money, humanitarians, uh, organizers of charity, those kinds of things. Are these the same people, like their um, tradition, would you consider them to be like the original um, revisionists too, like in Lenin's time? Like, is it the same sort of tradition? Is there, like, a contiguous, you know, movement like that, or no? Revisionism is a tendency inside Marxism, which is uh, anti-Marxist. And it came about uh, with this guy named Edward Bernstein, who, um pretty sure he was Austrian. And he... um he was a Marxist of sorts, but he thought that Marxism is really outdated in all kinds of ways. So he thought, well, let's change Marxism radically. Let's revise Marxism. Uh, he said that uh, now, we're, now we have parliament, so revolution is unnecessary and we, we can pass reforms. So class struggle is uh, unnecessary. And he just wanted to like get rid of these core ideas of Marxism in order to supposedly make Marxism better. And that's where the term revisionism originated. These days, of course, revisionism is considered a dirty word. If if you're a revisionist, then it means you're uh, somebody who wants to ruin Marxism. You can improve Marxism, you can update Marxism, you can apply Marxism to different conditions. But if you say you're a revisionist, then it really has a negative connotation. It means you want to remove essential parts of Marxism. So I wouldn't consider any of these to be a revisionist because these are, they're not inside Marxism. So would you say, like, modern social democracy is almost like a synthesis of the two? Like, of original bourgeois socialism and this coming from inside Marxism? In some ways, I guess, yes, because um, social democracy wants reforms and it wants to, like, improve conditions and, you know, make small changes, kind of like the bourgeois reformers. So sure, in that sense... But social democrats are usually workers and not capitalists. So there's also that. There still are some um, purely bourgeois utopian ideologies. I would say fascism is actually a pretty good example. Because fascism wants a society where you have, you essentially have capitalism but they don't call it capitalism. They kind of want a capitalism without capitalism. And they want to keep property in private hands. 
but they still somehow claim that it's for the greater good. So it's like capitalism, but not really capitalism, even though it is, and private property, but somehow it's not private, or at least if it's private, it's still for the collective somehow. And fascists also advocate class collaboration and not class struggle. Fascism is like a reactionary utopia. It's a conservative uh, utopia. Basically, capitalism, but with none of the negative aspects of capitalism. The only problem, of course, is that when you put it into actual practice, it still acts and looks exactly like capitalism. So then we get to critical utopian socialism and communism. I think uh, utopianism is a little bit more familiar to people. So who wants to explain what utopian socialism is? Utopian socialism is its actual socialism. It strives to create a classist society, but it doesn't have the materialist uh, critiques of capitalism. It doesn't truly understand the nature of capitalism, but it still tries to uh, attack capitalism and justify socialism through moral, ethical, or uh, idealist arguments. Uh, something to add to that, um, from what I understand, utopian socialists uh, had uh, really not touched on um, class distinction and uh, class conflict in general. Well, um, some of them did and some of them didn't. The thing about utopian socialism is that uh, it's such a broad category. I guess uh, the manifesto only talks about specifically the utopian socialism that existed at the time. But even in that, utopian socialism is a much broader um, category than the rest of these, like, you know, the feudal and petty bourgeois uh, socialism. Those, of course, don't really exist anymore because feudalism's gone, you know, they uh, disappeared. Uh, weird German idealism, uh, have, that went away, so the German true socialism is gone. But utopian socialism still kind of exists because... If we just define utopian socialism as idealist socialism that's more motivated by ethical views or moral views or religious views rather than a Marxist uh, materialist analysis, then there's tons of socialists like that even to this day. Plenty of religious socialists, plenty like these days we pretty much consider everybody who's not a Marxist or an anarchist socialist, we pretty much put them in the utopian category. I would even say, like, certain uh, certain Nazbols, I would, count, I would count them as utopians. National Bolshevism itself is such a wide thing. Like, some of those people are, like, really far-right fascists or whatever, but some of them are really just utopians who just are conservative, so uh, have conservative social views, or are nationalists. The... Um, What's what's the group called in uh, Colombia? Not not FARC, but the other one. Uh, the ELN. ELN is the one that I was talking about. I would say that they're a utopian, uh, they're a utopian socialist movement. They're like Christian socialist. I'm pretty sure. Uh, Essence of time in Russia. They're like Orthodox Christian uh, socialists who are like patriotic and somewhat influenced by Marx. I would say that they're utopians. They're not really Marxists. Even, um, what's it called? The, uh, what was the thing that was uh, associated with, um, with the Zeitgeist, uh, movie? Venus Project, right? The Venus Project, yeah. The, the automatic, like the computer city thing, yeah. Uh, also, isn't that kind of like uh, the meme, uh, fully automated uh, luxury gay space communism? Yeah, and resource-based uh, resource economy. I would say that that's a modern form of utopianism. They don't even call it socialist. They're just like, hey, wouldn't it be cool if we all just owned everything together and then robots made stuff and then we just rationally allocated resources? Yeah, that's socialism. That's communism. They're like, yeah, it's so stupid how we have to do everything based on profit. Shouldn't we just are like rationally plan things? But then they call it resource-based economy because they don't want to call it socialism. But it's basically a modern utopia. Oh, this is also an interesting thing. There's so many different kinds of utopian socialism. There were like the Narodniks were also utopian socialists. So the, Nar the, the main strategy of the Narodniks was terrorism. So uh, that's kind of... You know, they didn't think they should organize the proletariat. 
Instead, they thought they should have a heroic group of individuals who commit these assassinations. Um, there were also other utopians who thought that they should just like secretly infiltrate the government and take it over. Um, there were some utopians who thought that they should just convince the bourgeoisie that really it would be best if we had socialism and then the bourgeoisie is just going to agree, right? <laughs> well, that didn't really happen, but there were many different kinds of utopians that had many different strategies and most of them didn't involve uh, organizing the proletariat for an uprising or for a revolution. So the term utopian, it refers to you know, th them wanting to build a utopia, so a perfect society. So what they would do is they would try to get a bunch of money and then they would like buy an island or buy a, a piece of land or something and they would build like a little commune there and then they would all go there. And that would be their utopia. And there were tons of utopian movements that tried to do this. There was even uh, a Finnish guy named um, Kurikka who built one in... Australia and I think another one in Canada, these communes. And this is still a thing that happens these days. And I guess these days that might be called a cult. If you just get a bunch of people and you build your own little compound in the woods. But yeah, they, there's still lots of people. Um, even in Finland, there's lots of uh, green eco communes and anarchist communes and um, religious communes. I think it comes from the fact that organizing and trying to... Uh, create a revolution is pretty hard so if it was really an option to just build a commune in the woods that seems easier it seems way way easier unfortunately that doesn't really work but there's still lots of people who try to do that because it's a lot easier than actually overthrowing the state for those in the u.s an example of this is the quote new left in the 60s like the hippie movement and all that kind of stuff they often bought a piece of land and built their own commune. And, I mean, obviously that didn't bring about socialism. Yeah, and what's that um, Christiania, or whatever it's called? Is that, uh, like, in Denmark? Freetown Christiana? Freestaden Christiana? Yeah, it's in Denmark. It's like a city where the government has just left. They just thought, well, okay, let the hippies take over the city. It's like a bunch of wasteland, basically. There's one... That I heard about pretty recently in Finland. It's called, um, if I was to translate this roughly into English, it's, it's like supporters of humanity or recognizers of humanity. It's a small sort of, uh, religious movement that is influenced by like Eastern religions mixed with Christianity. I heard about it on the radio and they just live in, they live like on a farm. Some of them work and earn money. And they just bring money to the commune. And then there's other people who just like till the soil or do household chores. And they all just live there. They don't, they don't have any private money of their own. And then they do lectures uh, against war, which actually seems pretty cool. It's not exactly threatening to overthrow capitalism or anything, but it is an example of modern utopianism. And in the 19, late 19th century, the Tolstoy movement, this like a pacifist, communalist, Christian anarchist movement. Oh, yeah, definitely. Yeah, Tolstoy was pretty interesting. He he thought that they should just throw out the Old Testament that it, and it's garbage and outdated. And you should just take what Jesus said and then like create a new set of commandments based on that, which is even these days, if somebody said that, that would sound completely wild, like, what? Okay, so then, why are all these reactionary? I'm sure you can think of many reasons why, but if you had to sum up, what's reactionary about all of these? I mean, to me, there seems to be a huge lack of understanding, like a material understanding of uh, really the class, uh, the class distinctions and the class conflict in general. Yeah, definitely that's one. Anything else? Um, a lot of them are very class collaborationist with the whole, we can convince the bourgeoisie to just, you know, join our side, whatever. Yeah, I've, I've said this before. So uh, I would say characteristics of Marxism, it's scientific slash materialist. It's 
based in the worker, so it's proletarian, and it's revolutionary instead of reformist, so it's scientific, revolutionary, proletarian socialism. While these other ones tend to be idealist, uh, non-proletarian, so they're based either in small owners or actual capitalists, or they're at least not clearly proletarian. The utopians are like, in my opinion, the best group of these, and they still uh, don't really firmly rely on the proletariat. But the short answer why these are all reactionary is because they're all uh, opposed to progress. The utopians perhaps less than others, but the manifesto points out that, quote, they violently oppose, the violently is not literal because a lot of utopians were pacifists or reformists, but um, they violently oppose all political action on the part of the working class. Such action, according to them, can only result from blind unbelief in the new gospel. And then it gives examples. Uh, the Owenites, who were British utopians, the Owenites in England and the Fourierists in France, uh, respectively, oppose the Chartists and the reform reformists. Uh, Chartists were like um, a prototype of the trade union movement, so they were a legitimate workers' movement. So they all oppose progress, they all oppose actual uh, political organizing uh, by the proletariat for, their, for class struggle. Last question. Uh, describe the relation of communists to other opposition parties. And the manifesto calls them opposition parties, but I would call them um, basically any party that wants to overthrow the current establishment. So any other revolutionary parties, whether they be socialist or not, or proletarian or not. What do you guys think is the relationship, with, uh, relationship of the communists with these uh, other revolutionaries? It's a relevant question for today as well. Like to try to recruit them and radicalize them? Yeah, sure. Well, something worth uh, keeping in mind is that at the time when the Communist Manifesto was written, there weren't communist parties in every country. And the communist movements were pretty small. In chapter one, it talked about how the communists don't put forward any interests that are different from the rest of the workers' movement. Because at the time, what the workers' movement was trying to do was to become an independent political power that's not just a pawn of the capitalists against the feudal, against the feudal arist aristocracy, but an actual independent uh, political movement. And everybody was kind of on the same page about overthrowing feudalism and overthrowing the monarchy. So the left wasn't as split as it is now. Because back then it was all about just organize the proletariat into an independent class and overthrow feudalism. So therefore, it wasn't necessary for the communists to radically split. Say, for example, to split from revolutionary bourgeois. Therefore, the manifesto says... Uh, Chapter 2 has made clear the relations of the communists to the existing working class parties such as the Chartists in England and the agrarian reformers in America, which is that the communists support Chartists, they support the workers' parties, and they support the workers' movement, and the only thing that's different between communists and other workers is just that communists have a scientific socialist analysis and they're very class conscious but they don't really have different interests from the rest of the workers. And it says, The communists fight for the attainment of the immediate aims for the enforcement of the momentary interest of the working class, but in the movement of the present, they also represent and take care of the future of that movement. In France, the communists ally with the social democrats against the conservative and radical bourgeoisie, reserving, however, the right to take up a critical position in regard to phases and illusions traditionally handed down from the Great Revolution. They have the same aims in many cases as um, the Social Democrats. French uh, Social Democrats are the same as the French reformists, I'm pretty sure. So the communists have a different point of view and they have, a, they have different ideas and different views, but they still share common goals so they can work together, but they feel like they still want to maintain their own ideological independence. 
in Switzerland, they support the radicals without losing sight of the fact that this party consists of antagonistic elements, partly of social, uh, partly of democratic socialists in the French sense, partly of radical bourgeois. In Poland, they support the party that insists on an agrarian revolution as the prime condition for national emancipation. That party, which fomented the insurrection of Krakow in 1846. In Germany, they fight with the bourgeoisie whenever it acts in a revolutionary way against the absolute monarchy, the feudal squirearchy, and the petty bourgeoisie. That part I have a question about. Go ahead. Um, so in this, in this time, uh, they're talking about siding with the bourgeoisie uh, against the, the petty bourgeoisie. Um, why was that? Is that there's a historical answer to that question? I guess I just don't know it. Uh, based on chapter three, I would say that it it's because um, if the petty bourgeoisie, in this case, um, takes like a reactionary stance of just wanting to go back to feudalism, and the capitalist class, on the other hand, wants to overthrow feudalism. But of course, the petty bourgeoisie is a very complicated class. It can basically uh, part of it can be revolutionary, and part of it can be reactionary. In short, the communists everywhere support every revolutionary movement against the existing social and political order of things. That's a pretty interesting statement. Communists everywhere support every revolutionary movement against the social and political order of things. That must must have sounded completely terrifying to capitalists who were reading that at the time. Like, holy f- Just anything that overthrows the status quo do you think that's still uh, true to this day? Um, I do think that uh, that statement uh, that communists everywhere support every revolutionary m- movement against the existing social political order of things. Um, I do think that still rings true today. Uh, I think there are a lot of um, events that happen um, in modern society that people think are revolutionary, like... Uh, like Maidan in, uh, in Ukraine and stuff like that. But, um, I mean, we don't really define that as revolutionary because it didn't really, you know, challenge the, the, the social political order of things in that country. It really just instilled, um, you know, a more strengthened reactionary uh, bourgeoisie in that country, as far as I understand. But, um, yeah, I do, think, I do think that we still support every, every revolutionary movement um, depending on its class characteristics. Yeah, I would agree with that statement. There's all kinds of uh, movements and uprisings and riots like Hong Kong or whatever, but they're not necessarily always revolutionary. When they are revolutionary, we naturally would support them. I guess uh, in those times, uh, there were two kinds of revolutions. So there, there were bourgeois democratic revolutions which were trying to overthrow uh, feudal uh, relations and the feudal system and you also could have had a genuine proletarian socialist revolution Uh, i guess the paris commune was an attempt at that these days there's not a whole lot of feudalism left but apart from only having socialist revolutions there's also uh, of course national liberation movements and anti-imperialist movements which we support even if they aren't always socialist but if they're anti-imperialist or i guess anti-fascist as well anti-fascist uh revolutions democratic revolutions yeah so on the um uh the whole us supporting every um movement against the existing order or social order of things as well um I think that also touches on some of the like superstructural elements of capitalism, like um, for instance, like the restructuring of the family unit from feudalism to capitalism to make more of a socialist sort of family unit, stuff like that. Yeah, I guess like uh, political order is pretty clear. It means the you know the reigning uh, government or whatever, but yeah, the social order of things, I guess. In English, doesn't that usually mean what you're talking about? Like, typically, yeah. Um, but it could also mean it could also just mean like, um, you know, getting rid of like alienation and stuff like that. I'm not sure. 
in chapter two, it uh, does talk about abolishing uh, bourgeois marriage, which we talked about last time, which uh, I guess for those uh, people who weren't there, it just basically means uh, abolishing the system where uh, women don't work and aren't like equal members in society where they're basically economically reliant on men, men who are breadwinners and um, yada yada. Yeah. Um, when Marx says that a communist should support every revolutionary movement against the social and political order of things, I, I would agree with that because uh, in the Foundations of Leninism, Stalin says you should support he uses the example of the Emirate of Afghanistan against uh, British imperialism. And uh, like, you support the anti-imperial struggle because it's against capital. And today you have, we had the Hong Kong protest. That was in favor of British imperialism. It, it still seeks to preserve the general order in support of imperialism. Yeah, or even in favor of American imperialism, they were calling for Trump to like come liberate them. And... Right. Yeah. It was. Uh, it was even. They were not even talking about preserving that order, but regressing back, <laughs> going backwards. Yeah, or just. I mean, if we think that American imperialism rules the world, well, they want to re- retain that or even strengthen that 